Um, well, hi everyone. Um, my name is John Scalen. I'm in the geography department. Welcome to this teaching and summer workshop with an uh, American culture's specific focus. I'm Jake Martin Grumbach from uh, uh, the poli sci department. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, let's see, let's see how to point out here. Yeah, so this is the basic schedule. Um, here we are right now. Um, we'll be talking about sort of tips for teaching in summer classes more generally because we got a lot of interest beyond the American Cultures program, so we thought we'd first talk more generally how do I fit a semester-long class in the summer, right? That's a lot of people's concern. Then we'll have lunch at around 11.45. Um, Douglas Parada of the American Culture Center back there will talk a little bit about the history of the American culture's requirement on campus, which is how to, has a unique history. Well, then we'll talk specifically to, uh, to issues of teaching the American to the American culture's curriculum, right, where you have essentially one opportunity in many cases for students to learn about the complicated and sort of multi-level histories of uh, race, class, and gender in the United States. Right? Sometimes it's they fulfill it with one requirement, and sometimes it's, you know, not, students don't take much else that relates to those fields. And then we'll sort of end with reflections, final questions, some of your experiences in the classroom as well. Uh, and that's the, that's the setup for today. Uh, but maybe first, let's just go around and do introductions, and just tell us your name, uh, the department that you're teaching in, or that you're affiliated with, or if those are two different things, both of those, and then the course you're teaching this summer, or if you're not, if you're not teaching specifically this summer, uh, you know, what brings you to uh, this workshop more general? Whoever wants oh. to start. Oh, why don't I get started? Right. Um, uh, again, I'm Jake Martin Grumbach from the uh, uh, poli sci department. Uh, last year and uh, continuing into this year, I'm teaching a summer course uh, called Race and Inequality in American Politics, tentatively titled uh, PS1 and AC, uh, an intro class as well. Um, was that it, John? Yeah, yeah, and I guess I'll say I got started teaching the summer, um, teaching the Urban Experience Geography 70 AC. And that's how I got affiliated more with the American Cultures uh, program, and you know, took took this on as part of sort of essentially sharing my experiences in teaching that class a couple for a couple summers. But I'm not teaching this this coming summer. Uh, hi, I'm Hannah Michelle. Um, I'm teaching in the Asian American and Asian Disorders Studies Department, and I'm teaching a class on Korean pop culture. Um, <coughs> I will be teaching, my name is Adam Jado, I'll be teaching um, Geography 138, which is Global Environmental Politics slash Political Ecology. Uh, my name is Seth Denison, and I'm also in the Geography Department, and I'll be teaching a uh, field course on buildings and cities, which is I think 182. Uh, hi, my name is Eric Gihara, uh, I'm straddling multiple sites. Just graduated last year. Uh, I'm lecturing at State, South Dakota State in Asian American Studies. I'm a uh, visiting scholar here in the Women Gender Studies, and 
Um, yeah, so I'll be teaching race and ethnicity uh, on film, uh, looking through the uh, mixed uh, framework, mixed race and ethnic, ethnic framework. My name's Andrea Wise. I'm the assistant director of the Public Service Center, and um, part of my role is also supporting the ACES program, the American Culture Engaged Scholarship Program. So I'm in my, I think, third month of my job and just um, wanting to hear kind of what faculty are doing <coughs> about and um, how this content is also taught in this context. So thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Kristen Rasmussen. I'm a teaching faculty member in the nutrition department. And um, I've taught the course Food, Culture, and the Environment for many years. And um, I teach it every spring. And I did teach it for a few summers. But then we, we, did, we got approval for it to be an AC course. But we've never actually taught it. So now I'm currently working on making it an AC online course. But we did do the ACES program a few years ago without officially being an American Cultures course, it was kind of funky, but, but um, I would love to talk to you more about, about that, about maybe bringing that back, but that's what I'm working on right now. I'm Sarah Borchoff, I'm in psychology, and I teach cultural psychology. Hey everyone, um, my name is Eduardo Bautista, I'm in jurisprudence and social policy, but um, also GSI for legal studies, and I'm actually, well, for the next next week or two. Uh, I'm also a GSI for one of the AC courses, Big Ideas in Prison. Big Ideas on what? Prison. What, and that's also legal studies. Uh, it's crosses of legal studies, uh, ethnic studies, and social welfare. So I am Alessandro de Giorgi. I'm affiliated with San Jose State University, the Department of Justice Studies. Um, but I'm going to be teaching a summer course here in the legal studies. Um, Program, it's uh, Punishment, Culture, and Society, and it's 160. I'm Kitty Talavita, and I'm retired from the Department of Criminology and Law and Society at UC Irvine, and an affiliate at the Center for the Study of Law and Society and the JSP program here, and I'll be teaching the Legal Studies uh, program uh, 103 Theories of Law and Society, which basically means Mark's favorite term. <laughs> I'm Joanna and I'm in geography. I'm going to teach a role of moral agents and people's geography and education and just focus on the geography course. But um, now I'm providing a piece of the book that I teach at, but I love being in the book. I'm Robert Barnes and I teach in gender and women's studies. This summer I'm teaching an introduction. Hey, uh, no, thanks very much for coming. So we're uh, going through uh, sort of main department and uh, classroom teaching. Hi, I'm Kirsten Baca. I'm in the anthropology department this summer. I'm teaching for general studies, archaeology, and sex. Miss anybody else? Uh, Doug, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Parada. I'm the Program Associate for the American Culture Center. And I'll be talking to you more about uh, what the American Culture Center, the requirement, where it came from, and some resources that we have to offer instructors and way that we help instructors develop their courses. So you'll hear more about that a little bit later. So, thanks. Cool. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, it sounds like everybody's teaching really fun courses. <laughs> kind of courses that would maybe want to teach or take uh, either one. Um, so at about 10.30, we'll have someone from ETS coming in to talk a little bit about some of the technologies that are available for, especially for teaching in summer to make things a little bit easier. One thing that I can go ahead and pass out these two flyers now. Well, one is a flyer and one is a um, there's a sort of packet, uh, which one of the one of the elements of teaching in summer that has to do with time management is how to and keeping students kind of excited and interested is aided immensely by having access to film clips, multimedia resources, uh, things of this nature, as well as 
making that content accessible to students. So we do have the Media Resources Center on campus. A lot of students don't really know about it. Uh, it's in the, the first floor of Moffitt. Um, and you can check out DVDs if your computer you has a DVD player anymore. Um, but more and more, I think, students are uh, utilizing streaming services, um, whether of the um, tolerated or fully legal variety. Uh, so these are some pretty these are some pretty good resources. Um P especially has access to a huge number of films. And they're organized thematically, they're organized sort of with instructors in mind rather than with you know like Netflix where it's sort of you know what the algorithm says you might enjoy, which is a bunch of bad movies from the um, so that's a very useful resource. I really haven't delved into that quite as much. Uh, another resource that I think is maybe on the handout, but we can talk about a little bit more if it's not, is the Calisphere uh, site, which gives you access to the online archive of California, all of the images from there, as well as a lot of film clips, historical film clips, etc. Um, so I guess we can dive in and then just take a quick break now our uh, ETS colleague comes in. So, ah, here we are. Oh, so maybe we'll go around and actually ask one question. I know that we did this in the RSVP form, but just right now. One question that you'd like to, that you're, that really motivates you to come here, that you're sort of, most that's at the top of your mind when you're thinking about teaching in the summer. What, what, What's, what are the preoccupations now that we're you know, less than a month away from the session? <laughs> yeah? Um, how to have uh, different, how to have assignments and that evaluate learning without overwhelming myself with grading constantly for six weeks. Right. Um, I'm interested in trying to figure out a program to do some experiential learning and like partnering with um, school actors or to like the structure of like this sort of really restrictive class community. Yeah, and sort of creative assignments outside of the work main streets or essay in the final format that I'm also interested in. Yes. I'd like to hear other people's experiences with using interactive uh, exercises and things like that in class because of the intensity of I think you need to shape it up by having in class stuff. And I have some in mind, but I'd like to hear of other people's activities. Excellent question on the point, given that well, we have these long class sessions during the summer, too. This sort of relates to Matt's point, because I also want to have a field exercise or a practice component. But what, generally, what we can actually think about and expect of summer students, given that there is a very, maybe, different profile, where they're coming from, where they are educationally, et cetera. Um, I've, I've taught in the summer, so I guess I'm still, you know, could always be better, but I, I'm more concerned with the American culture's content and being able to, you know, not leave anything out and cover everything and not offend anybody and tell the rights, tell the stories in a way that's really respectful. I'm interested, I, I taught this class last year too, but um, because it's an American culture class, it, it, it picks up students that can take it as a requirement, and so you get these students that are resistant to American cultures or things like that, to just hearing what folks do with those sort of students. Yeah, I thought um, some course as well, <coughs> six weeks, uh, but I only have maybe 20 students. This uh, class would be larger, so how to deal with big classes in the <coughs> week. Do you know how, approximately how large the new class would be? How long? How large the new class would be? Um, it can take up to, let's see, um, I'm not sure, 50. But, you know, it, I'm hoping to get at least 35 or more, so I think it might get a good size. And then, yeah, it depends on the department. So you have 54 or something is the one GSI summer. Yeah, and I think 35. Or that's the, the minimum, right? Yeah, minimum, the, yeah. The minimum. Yeah. 54 or something like that. And then there's another question over here. Yes. How do you find out how many people are enrolled in your class? We'll go through that with the technology as well, but yeah, then okay. the, uh, uh, um, we have, they use telebears and then 
you, we look it up on uh, what's the Cal Central. Cal Central. Now it's all yeah, centralized. Yeah, now it's all right. Cal Central. So Operational that's... excellence has centralized and kind of cost to put this all on calcentral.berkeley.edu. Yeah, that's one of those sort of new dashboard type of things for instructors and students. You can see your everything from your W-2s and earning statements to, oh no, those are somewhere else, but you know, kind of centralized the enrollment procedures. So you can add and drop students, although it's still kind of wonky to do that currently. They're supposedly improving that, but I'm not exactly holding my breath. But calcentral.berkeley.edu is where you will see your enrollment, where you'll see your wait list, et cetera, et cetera. So formerly Fairfax, I guess, would have had this kind of right. centralized this past school year. And yeah. Calcentral, thanks for yeah. yeah. Um, the thing that I'm, I'm similar to the previous comment about um, Reconciling different backgrounds of different students for the summer. Um, I did GSI the class I am about to teach a few years ago, and it was the most difficult class I had GSI because it had a wide range of students' backgrounds. Um, really strong history majors and um, brand new junior transfers who took for an easy credit. And I imagine that will be only more disparate in the summer. So, um, and in my class right now, I just looked at 13. So it's a small enrollment and sort of managing the different expectations of my classes. Um, my, um, my expectation this summer is that the majority of students are international students with varying degrees of um, um, familiarity with English. And I think that, that I could use help you know, engaging with students. Yeah, so some of us don't have a Cal ID. We can't get on the site. But, you, just, you, know. you can look on the website that the students use to enroll. Um, that's what I just used. It's um, classes.org.edu. Oh, yeah, the just schedule like, classes tells how many yeah, students are showing enrollment. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to check, but in the future, for uh, sort of to send mass emails to the class, for other reasons, they will give you a log on as, a, as an instructor at some point, but uh, uh, through the department you're affiliated with that's providing the class, should probably have. Uh, uh, go through the sort of central bureaucracy and get you this login. Uh, so yeah. I would think, they're yeah, sending them an email. Yeah, yeah. they're struggling with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds plausible. <laughs> <laughs> Any last questions? I think that basically yeah. covered the range that we had prepared and the range that the range of questions that were sort of on people's mm -hmm. minds for last year as well. So there's a lot of continuity in what people bring in, and this is perfect timing actually, um, to hear a little bit from ETS. And Paula, and your last name? Uh, Miranda. Miranda. All right, so if you want to take, do you need me to pull anything up on, electronically for you? Um, yeah, actually, if you could just bring it up, I'll just use this computer and go with the equipment. And then you don't expect, you know, so it's extended. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Is that cool? So it's just yeah. extended that yeah. All right, so I want to take a look at Hi, everyone. Um, I know I only have about 10 or 15 minutes, so um, instead of me like telling you maybe stuff you may not want to hear about, if you have like maybe questions that you can just shout out. Um, about B-Courses. I'll just give you a quick overview of what it is, actually. Um, if you don't already know, B-Courses is the learning management system for the campus. So if you're familiar with it, if you've used it as a student or as an instructor in the past, basically um, a place online where you can put your course materials, where you can create assignments, have a grade book for students, put up your syllabus, that kind of thing. So basically putting your course materials online, that's, um, that's what B-Courses is. And it is located. So and it's also voluntary too. That you don't necessarily you don't have to use it, but it's there for you if you need it. Um, you get what's called, or you can create what's called a course site, um, and uh, you would have to create that yourself. Um, can't type and talk at the same time, unfortunately. Um, And the, the address, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's bcourses.berkeley.edu. And if, if you already have um, your CalNet ID, um, you'll be able to log in because that's basically what um, is needed to get access. 
And this is what it looks like. Um, you'll have, if, once you create courses, you'll see them pop up as like square icons here. You have a to-do list. And, uh, so instructors and students have the same kind of dashboard. Everybody sees the same view. It's just depend the, the thing that is different is your access. Um, create a site is right here. So um, if you need to create a site for your course um, and you've already been assigned to it, like you already have your um, official course assignments, you can go here, create a site, and it's kind of like a, I can't demo it here because I'm an admin, but it'll walk you through. It's like a step-by-step, -step, maybe five-step process to get that set up. And then once you, once you get a site, um, you can go, so in courses here, you have a list of your courses that have these two. This is the demo site, and I'll just click that to go in. The mouse uh, works a little bit better than the trackpad, I think, right now. Okay. So this is what a course site looks like. Um, it has these links here on the left-hand side and then various configurations of what you can do to customize what your home page is um, and what information you put. Um, there's a place here for syllabus. I usually like to tell instructors about the syllabus tool, which is where you can upload your syllabus. Um, I mean, there's kind of a bunch of places where you can upload and get content, but this syllabus tool here um, has It has, um, it's not just a place for you to upload your syllabus or copy and paste your syllabus, but it also has a calendar. It has um, these assignment, like how, how your um, assignments can be broken down. Um, and here I just, I copied and pasted from my syllabus from like a Word file that I already had, but um, you can simply just make a link to it here. Um, and I'm just going to do kind of an overview. I don't want to do step by step. What I would suggest is if you want to learn more, if you want to set up your course site for um, your class, go here to help. And we have a various um, help options where we can sit down with you or do like a screen share um, remotely. And um, we're happy to help you get set up step by step for, for your class to see what you need. I just kind of wanted to show you or highlight some of the tools. Um, that are that's available to you. So help, help here, and then we have, um, in order to get set up for a consultation with us, just um, schedule, um, click this link, and it'll take you to um, a Google Calendar, and you can sign up for a slot, like a 30 minute time slot. Um, we also have upcoming workshops, I think, next week or the week after. Um, well, we can also sit down with you, um, depending on like attendance. If you're if you only one or two people, which is um, usually the case, we can customize it a little bit more to meet um, attendees needs. Um, and then also we have drop-in support hours. We have drop-in support hours um, in Dwanal 117. I'll make sure to add that for some reason. I don't see it up here. But um, we have office at like um, support folks um, uh, one, uh, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and we can help you out. Um, so just keep in mind that. Um, any questions about communication or um, adding, like any specific questions that you'd like to know or things that you'd want to see that I can? Yeah. So I, I do have for a class where the, the instructor is set up. Um, Reading within it so that yeah. it would like automatically calculate things. I was curious about that. Yeah, I think so. Good, good question. Um, so the, that the gradebook is dependent on assignments here, and um, so every time you create a B courses assignment, it creates a column in the gradebook, and um, so you can kind of see this is how I've set up assignments and. Keep in mind, this is like a demo course, so there's kind of a bunch of stuff in here, but you see that there, I've set up assignment groups, so um, to kind of categorize, or to put it as, as like categories for assignments. Right? So participation could be one, um, homework could be one. It just depends on how you break down your grading team. Um, and each of these 
assignment groups corresponds to like a percentage of the total grade. So, um, you know, there's, I mean, you can create as many assignment groups as you want. It just has to correspond basically with how much you're grading or what you're grading looks like in your course. Question related to that. So when I set up courses for, I did this for my class, uh -huh. and I didn't realize that I also took attendance through it. I didn't yeah. realize that it was counting that in the grade book. It does, and so yeah. At the end of the semester, so I was actually counting it twice, and then that's what was in the grade. And then at the end of the semester, oh, no. they were higher than it should have been. Yeah. Uh, so is there a way to keep it from doing that? Because I usually think that it's part of the Yeah, I mean, if you don't want to. Uh, you, if you don't want to track attendance, don't use the attendance tool, and it will generate um, a column. Because once you start taking attendance, it'll start counting and it'll actually like ping your students, hey, you got a new like grade every time you take attendance. But there's no way to take attendance without it adding it to the Um, There is, actually. Well, no. Unfortunately, no, there is not. Yeah. Um, it, if you're using the attendance tool that's like built in um, into Canvas or eCourses, then it will uh, automatically capture it. Um, one thing I do recommend if you are going to set up assignments for your course is to mute the assignment. Um, that way you can you have kind of some, what, what muting does is it, it prevents students from seeing their grade and it prevents them from getting notified about their grade, which, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced a student saying, oh no, like, I don't want, you know, I, what's happening, like, you changed my grade, or I saw somebody else have a grade, and how come I don't have a grade yet? So to kind of help you with that, or manage those kinds of um, requests, once you create an assignment, go to the grade book, or grades, which takes you to the grade book. And then, um, unfortunately, it's not like an option that you have when you first create the assignment. You have to create the assignment first, and then you do it. Um, so this is what the grade book looks like. And um, if for an assignment that you want to meet, like for example, you see this little icon here, that one I've muted already. But you just hover over the header, and you'll see this um, little arrow for options, and you'll just want to meet an assignment. And that saves you probably like a lot of headache from <laughs> having to answer support questions from students and that kind of thing. Yes? Yeah, I have a sort of similar question. Um, is there any way to do um, assignments that aren't graded? Yes. Okay. Well, yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to just collect them, right? Yeah. yeah, you just want to collect them, sure. So um, that's an option that you have when you create an assignment. So for example, I'm just going to, let's see, I'll create, I'll go to this one. Um, so for when you create an assignment and you go into the options of it, or when you're seeing the options for it as you're creating it, this is what you'll see. And if you don't, so you have the ability to add points, um, you know, choose which assignment group it belongs to, and how you want to display grades. And then right underneath that, there's this option, do not count this assignment towards the final grade. So you'll still have the ability to like um, provide feedback, put some points in, even though it's not necessarily like towards the grade. I mean, you could do like complete or incomplete. Um, even though it's not going to affect the total points of the grade, but um, that's available to you. And that way you have some mechanism for collecting um, grades or collecting assignments online. Can you show in this field also how to make sure that people can turn it in? in the, oh, in yeah, yeah. Because this is a tricky thing. To, to, oh, to just use turn it in? No, 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 sorry, not, not the website turn it in. Oh, okay. Other, um, the, how they turn it in? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's just an extra step. In, Oh, okay. How to upload. How to upload. So, File upload. yeah, so this is, so you have these types of submission types. Uh, one is online, and that'll allow you to collect um, papers online. Usually, a lot of instructors, because they teach face-to-face -face or in class, um, they want to be able to have the option to collect it in class as well. So, usually what we like to recommend is just say that the submission type is online. And then that way, the students who want to submit online can, and the students who want to submit in person on paper also have the option. Um, and then other submission types here are um, no submission. So this is just something that you created. Maybe the activity was in class. There's no like, paper to turn in. Um, on paper, obviously, something that's just like a hard copy that they turn in. And external tools don't worry about that. Um, 
And then here, the um, online entry options, you have file uploads. It's pretty common. Media recordings also, the people are starting to use that a lot more. But basically, um, there's a way it allows students to, to record themselves or um, submit like an audio file or a video file. Um, website URL, text entry, I like having this option also with file uploads just in case, like maybe they don't have um, the, a document, they're just going to write in their, their response. So that's also, these two are nice options to have. And we usually say don't, um, we usually recommend don't restrict upload file types because this is pretty common, like you mistype something, you misset the extension, or something happens, it's just, it causes more problems. <laughs> I mean, unless you're having them specifically turn in, like you have to have like an Excel doc, which I don't think any instructors, you know, um, uh, require. Just leave that unavailable. And then um, enable Turnitin submissions. This is a tool that checks for uh, plagiarism if you want to do that um, for your papers. Um, and then, did you want me to demo like how students submit it? No, only I feel like there's a couple times when someone's like, you have to go into the file thing and like turn on PDFs, make sure that's collected. Oh, but perhaps yeah. it's changed. Yeah, no, for this one, if it, if you just do file uploads, it'll pretty much accept any file thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, could you talk briefly about the, uh, I've seen, I've seen on the, the, there's a possibility to peer edit. Can you just explain how that works? If I, wanted, I know I've seen that box in there, but I've never known how it works. Like, if I wanted to assign a, do an assignment that I could have, you know, other students like peer edit. Yeah, definitely. So one thing to note about peer editing is, um, okay, so you would, is this the peer review assignment? I could maybe show you the end part of this. So let me. options 
just like with our own assignments mm -hmm. about when it's available, when to shut it down. Um, that kind of thing. So, just take a look at some of the, you know, just basic true or false. Um, you can get fancy if you have like math um, equations and whatnot, but there's um, upload file, multiple choice of video, um, essay questions, images. You have some, some options there. Yes. Um, this semester I had a group assignment, and I thought I set it up so that they would turn it in and everyone would see the uh, response, the score and response. And so I did group assignment, and then I said let the students enter their group mates, but then didn't end up working out the way that I expected. Like, I thought, I, you know, they their groups of four, and one person submits the paper, and I thought that they would be able to put in their group members' names, and everyone could see. Put in their group members' names? Yeah. So if I submit the paper for my group and I put my group members, then they can all see what the score is and the paper and the markups in, uh, yeah. in the grading place. Yes, correct. So I did that, but then they, there was nowhere for them to put the group names. I'm, I might have to um, follow up or, or meet with you um, okay. about that. Yeah, cool. just send an email that we can go through it because it um, sounds like, um, sounds like and it should work, so I'm not sure where the missing piece is okay. on that side. Cool. Any other questions? Um, and again, um, please you know, come to us. Uh, again, 117 UML if you have any questions, um, things that you want to work out before your class starts. Um, we're really happy to sit down and work with you. I'm going to go back to the peer review for a second. So it's um, the program automatically generates the, the pairs? If you want, pairs? yeah. If okay. you have the option to um, automatically pair. Okay. Pairs. Or you can have multiple people okay. with you. Yeah. I just have a super quick question. Sure. There's no way to hide their overall grade in the course, right? If you put in grades as assignments, it's going to give generate an overall total grade. Uh, there is, but so you can just mute all of the assignments. So if you muted 100, but then they couldn't see their scores on anything. Right. Okay. Right. But so there's no way for them to see their scores on the individual assignments and not have a final grade. Yeah, no, that's, okay. that's correct. Yeah. Just pretty transparent. And that, that does create some difficulties mm -hmm. where, like, I have had people submit a, um, like, a proposal for their term project or something, and I attached a point value to it so that people would actually do it. You know, yeah. Five points. They get five out of five points just for doing it, but all of a sudden they have 100% on that entire assessment group. Right. They're like, oh, I'm doing really well, even though I like, <laughs> did really badly in the midterm. What's going on? Yeah. It's like, well, you're not actually doing that well yet. <laughs> yeah. It's like a running, a running tool. Yeah, it's just one of the bakeries of it. I've often hidden the gradebook, so I don't see the overall gradebook. They can see individual assignment grades coming through, but they can't see the overall gradebook, and then it gets away. They do have access to all their grades, though. That's just so, just as a heads up. Like, okay. Even though you, as an individual, have um, uh, hidden the gradebook, so for example, if I go really quick to the dashboard, there is a. There's a global grades tool that's, you know. Uh, puts all of their, their grades in aggregated grades. <coughs> I'm sorry, between all their classes? or Yeah, for all their classes. So even if you have hidden the grade book, they have this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you can't, like, yeah. there's... None of them have ever told me. You're <laughs> <laughs> doing it right. I, 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 I know. <laughs> okay. Well, this is the way that they see all their grades. Uh, awesome. Um, they don't want you to actually. Yeah. Right, right, right. Wow. So it's pretty inflexible. Uh, yeah, for <laughs> grades, yeah. It's, uh, but if you leave all the assignments, nothing will show up here. Right. right? Okay, right. So it doesn't calculate muted grades? It doesn't calculate muted. I mean, it calculates, it just doesn't show Yeah. I feel like there are several reasons why you would want to, like, include other types of evaluation and sort of grade adjustments throughout, like, participation. Yeah. Like, uh, sort of like, uh, as you go, you know, to training. Uh, it hasn't worked for me in the past. Either, like, um, for the, for the yeah, and it's not, yeah, it's not, a lot of people also just upload their documents or they tell their students, you know, I'm going to collect and you're going to see some grades in B courses and you get notified of them, but I'm going to be 
the real grades are going to be posted, you know, in Cal Central or wherever it is it's going to be done. So uh, it just kind of depends on how you are structuring your schedule. Because it varies by the course type, too. Yeah. So a more qualitative type of work that AC classes might be involved in mm -hmm. a little less amenable to this than one of the problem sets, maybe. copy and paste the actual URL of like the file tab you're on or the grade tab you're on and it'll actually always send the kid to their own or the student um, to their own uh, sort of uh, uh, that tab but from their own account so a file a PDF you uploaded as a reading or something like that you can actually use that URL and they'll have to log in with their uh, Cal ID and everything there are some there are some powerful tools in there. One thing in the when you create an assignment, for instance, if you are having students do a blog post, right, where posting a blog is sort of clunky within B courses or can be, right? Just you can create it on WordPress, and if they submit the URL of their blog post, then it creates a space for you to create it rather than trying to track between two, you know, two different websites. Um, I've done a little bit of stuff like embedding maps and embedding <coughs> through HTML on a particular page in B courses so they don't have to leave B courses to do things, which can be funky and I'm happy to answer the questions based on the extremely limited uh, experience I have doing that. So. The last thing I'll say is I have never, you know, just I billion times now, taught this uh, AC course on my own, uh, never once have I used uh, the B courses grading, and never will I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, I've always used Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. And it's, it's, it's okay. Touché. It's really impressive, especially if you're saying, especially for the quality of the evaluation. You know, it's, all, these tools are all kind of approximations towards some theoretical ideal type of topic. <laughs> um, okay, so right. This was the sort of the first the first stage of the day after the um, after the uh, B courses sort of mini tutorial, which is the kind of raw logistics of it. Before we get into some of the elements that are specific to AC in terms of you know dealing with the kind of distribution of ethnic groups requirement, for instance. The kind of the raw logistics of how you pack the something that really does count for a semester's worth of work into six weeks or ten weeks, which is scary for everybody involved, right? I don't, it's scary for the students involved as well when they look at the reading list. Um, so the first question that, or a oh, question we frequently get is, you know, what kinds of students can we expect to get? Um, I can say for. In my experience, um, yeah, you can have a lot more uh, international students, students who, uh, in many cases, are their first time ever in the United States. Um, and this also gets into the American culture requirement as well, but there's actually a huge amount of tacit knowledge that in understanding race in the United States or other settler colonies, um, requires that it's not part of this sort of visa application or something like that, right? It's not, there's a lot of tacit knowledge required. Um, but I would say that students with weaker English language skills in a variety of ways, um, the connection between Berkeley summer programs and Japanese universities is very strong. So I've had more Japanese students in my classes 
during summer than you know than I ever had during the rest of the year. Um, and I found Japanese students to be extremely good at reading and writing in English, and and had much more difficulty communicating in English, which made sort of a qualitative discussion-based class particularly difficult. Yeah, uh, that's similar. So not only so many more international students, uh, and so I've sent students to the International Student Center for English Language sort of help, uh, and uh, that I think is, I want to say, over in the uh, near the MLK Student Union. Uh, I can't remember, but you can Google International Students Berkeley, and it comes up with a list. They don't have great resources on this, and also within a six-week time period, they're not going to you know, radically improve their English conversation skills. So it's really tough, but uh, I think, so on the international students, and just in general, that, uh, uh, you know, undergraduate education is stressful for students sometimes, and, uh, uh, you know, you guys have sort of selected in or been selected for to teach AC courses probably in part because you are good with uh, sort of engaging with students on a deeper level and a... Uh, uh, in being a mentor and things like that. So I think early on, really promoting the idea, if you're having struggles, and I had the really the worst experience for me was an international student, sort of, we had a midterm that was kind of low-key, but uh, he just really started breaking down when he saw the sort of questions, and it was an extremely clear study guide. It was kind of a give me assignment, and he really uh, uh, just tried to explain that he didn't understand like a word I said throughout the entire class and this was three and a half weeks in and it was really a tough experience and I should have been, I was clear early on, but I should have just doubled down and said, you know, there's no shame in bringing these things up and similarly with students uh, who have, uh, who are having emotional or mental health troubles as uh, we know happens in undergraduate education, just really saying uh, be a you know squeaky wheel and bring this stuff really early. I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, and we'll continue a little on the international student stuff, and then then there's a broader question, sort of uh, uh, in general, getting all types of uh, students who may have never taken a class in anything like your department. Yeah, so, and I will also say I've also had elite inter uh, international students as well, and it creates um, it creates some good opportunities for comparative types of assignments that can be really useful. So there's, there's really a wide range. Um, the flip side is you also get students who are trying to get through their requirements as fast as possible because they don't have a lot of resources to expend on higher education the faster the better and are maybe computers. So that also brings brings in questions of how you design your assignments if someone sort of a burden for them to come to come to school on days when, you know, days that it would work for other students who kind of live on campus, for instance. So another question, and we'll get into some of the specific assignments. Oh, yeah. I just, I just have a quick question about um, how you identify students um, who, who like, Second language, and perhaps you're, you know, uh, struggle with the, with the comprehension or writing. Um, but also, um, if you use any alternative tools to get points for class participation for folks who feel less comfortable talking or speaking up in class. Right. I mean, this sort of this relates a little bit to this question as well, and a couple of the others that we have coming up. Um, I mean, a lot of uh, you can glean a lot of things from sort of icebreaker activities that I usually do because I'm coming from the geography department, which is, you know, draw the city where you're from. And, you know, dr like draw a kind of mental map of, of where you're from. You do that in groups or, pair or groups of three, for instance. And you can sort of glean kind of where people are at linguistically, but also, you know, the kind of diversity in the classroom as well, where everybody is coming from. Uh, in terms of assignments, I also try to get away from just sort of straight discussion or some sort of Socratic kind of situation. A lot of it is, you know, even like skill building, for instance, doing some very, very basic web mapping types of projects 
doing um, experiential learning, you know, out in the field, uh, having different kinds of assignments, such as photo essays, for instance, in lieu of the sort of term project, or which is a very short term. Did that get a little bit to what you were asking? So you fill that in instead of participation, or like that counts for participation? As part of participation. So yeah, the um, so one of the assignments I had was how to have students look at this new repository of redlining archives from the Federal Housing Administration, 1930s through 70s. Um, and you can actually look at the scans of the physical documents. Um, and students, I found students working in pairs or groups of three discussed and responded a lot more than in a sort of general kind of open, open discussion type of scenario. Um, and again, that would also count for if you're doing experiential learning out in the field, for instance, like if, if you're there and you're looking around and you're visibly engaged, right, that, that would count towards participation as well. Yeah. Do you know if the Student Learning Center is open in the summer? Because I often send students there for help with like writing papers and stuff. Um, I believe it's open at some sort of summer hours. Okay. That's a, that's a, we should Google it. Yeah. I've had, and this is maybe slightly old information, but I remember sending students to the Student, student Learning Center a lot um, who were having linguistic difficulties, and I think this was just an oversight on my part, but I eventually had a student be like, they don't really help you with language, they help you with structuring a paper, you know, and it's sort of like, I had never actually gotten that feedback from a student before, <laughs> so I've been leading students astray in some ways. So, certainly in you know, if, if the issue is a, a, you know, about structuring a paper or um, reading strategies or study strategies, then I think it's really helpful. But some of the linguistics, linguistic issues are, are a little bit distinct, maybe. What kind of, um, are, are there language requirements for that? What kind of requirements do they have to, to get into the course? Right. Class. So for international students, usually at their host, their home university, they have some sort of English language requirement, but it varies. I mean, we know geographically, sort of English proficiency in sort of primary school around the world, uh -huh. uh, and there's some places that where I was like, oh, are you from like Wisconsin or Minnesota? And you know, from Northern Europe somewhere, and the other people uh, really struggle, but have uh, passed their home language requirements. So it really does vary. So have you ever come across students who, as much as you want to help them and work with them, just don't have? Yes. And what do you do? So with that, I uh, the student eventually uh, that I mentioned eventually dropped the class, but uh, I should have just doubled it. I made it pretty clear, and mine uh, compared to John is nice. We have so John has used creative assignments and different things. Mine is a sort of was a really large class, more traditional lecture, some uh, discussion class-wide format, and I should have just, in the first couple classes, just really hammered home the point. If you don't feel like you're understanding this, like you need to come up and we'll figure something out, and uh, dropping a class is important like that, uh, and uh, I should have just uh, done it earlier. We had to go through, jump through some hoops to drop it late and things like that, and it would have saved everyone the stress if we had just doubled down. Um, but it depends, so I, I don't feel like my type of uh, sort of social science course, sort of mainstream, that needs to intro the Constitution and branch of government and all these things, like, it's really hard to do the more creative assignments, but um, that's one reason I'm happy to be here and uh, maybe learn techniques like that, but uh, for both types uh, of courses, uh, it's really important to try to catch people who might not be able. Yeah. Yeah, um, I taught a, a writing class two summer or last summer, um, where most of my students were from Asia, and because I'm actually from Asia and I can speak uh, Japanese, I was able. I mean, it was perfect class for me. Um, but you know, uh, so we did have. I did have you know uh, students who struggled with language. So what I did was I looked to see how much knowledge they acquired. Not necessarily the grammar, and you know, I mean, they would have to work on that. Six weeks, you know, we can't do it. 
and they have to do a book, and they have to do a beyond the six weeks. So, are they getting the, the knowledge that they need in this class, which is not necessarily, well, it was a writing class, but mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, you, you're still teaching something else with that writing. So, that's what I focused on, and they did, they all did well. That's an excellent, yeah. that's so, that's an excellent point, and uh, hopefully we can all work towards that sort of idealist. Um, I think uh, uh, it's also tough, it depends on sort of the content of the class too, where we'll get into this more, but uh, uh, for intro U.S. politics type of course, a student who's watched The Daily Show before or has an interest or really cared about the presidential election or something like that is just ridiculously advantaged. Um, so these things are, t it's compounds between language and then you know, thinking about what type of pop culture example I bring up or any of these things. These are things to just be aware throughout the teaching of the class and there's no perfect solution and we all have to customize based on what we're doing, but uh, uh, really just putting in the best effort we can to yeah. make the class advantage with them and successful. And I think we're gonna come we're gonna circle back around the question of how you design assignments in this for, for lesson planning, for instance, um, last year, uh, Justin Gomer, who was in American Studies, again, it's you have to think about the sort of class, right? It's a much more interpretive type of class compared to what it sounded like um, you were charged with teaching. The, uh, you know, what he said he would do is, you know, usually, in my case, I taught from 9 to 11.30, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And that's a big chunk of time. Right? That's a big chunk of time to just fill with a lecture, which when I first taught it, I was like, I am teaching my own class, I'm like writing my own lectures, and it's just sort of like dead, right? It was a lot of lecture, but at the same time, there are a lot of situations in which you need a lot of lecture if you're trying to catch people up on some of the nuances of U.S. <coughs> politics around race, for instance. What, um, what Justin did, and I'll just share it, is he would do a lecture on, on the sort of key concepts, right? Not, not having them read Foucault or something like that, right? Just lecture on, on the tough theory, not have them read the tough theory. And then Wednesday, a sort of discussion and group work. Uh, and then the Thursday, he would often do a relevant film with some commentary, right? Pause it and say, all right, you remember from Tuesday we talked about this <coughs> here, like this scene is really perfect. To kind of break up the rhythm of the course, which I think is, it could be, it can be valuable even if you feel like the parameters for your particular course are kind of constrained, right? That type of approach, because it can engage different sort of circuits of learning, for instance. Um, and then another thing that he would have is the assign the reading assignments. He would use uh, primary primary sources rather than sort of secondary you know, the theoretician writing about a particular thing, which I think would apply to American politics. Agreed. Reasons. No, I never assigned that. So no textbook, and it's good now. Uh, post twenty sixteen American politics, all textbooks are all wrong. And <laughs> But uh, also just assigning sort of, you know, getting students used to reading a sort of 750 word sort of newspaper style, op-ed style argument uh, was really helpful. In a long class period, so I had four days a week, uh, session D is six weeks, four days a week of two hour sessions. Nuts. It's completely <laughs> crazy. Um, most of the time I would just shorten uh, the uh, lectures a little bit. Uh, and this is, you guys are the instructors, so you can completely determine how you do this, but uh, I found, you know, GSI sections for my department are two hours long and nobody really goes over 90 minutes. Um, and there might be some, you know, maybe our psychologists in the room could tell us how <laughs> human attention drops off at a point or something like that. But I found it much more fruitful to do that and really encourage them, you, you know, it's tough to have them coming four days a week and then doing homework and assignments or reading and assignments, but really saying, you know, we're letting you out a little early, like use that half hour to try to read through one of these yeah. 750 word pieces. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like inevitably you're talking about custom content. Is that, am I getting that right? Custom content? Custom oh, content. Custom. Yeah. 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 Like that it's sounds inevitable. Compared to a semester yeah. version. Let me see what... I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Depend, like, so it depends on, the, I found that in my department, 
I was, you know, I was very excited to get control at GSI to class like this that was not AC accredited a bunch of times, and I was really excited to teach this course because I figured I could, um, I don't know, could make this a little more engaging, and, and I found that I really did actually get through most of this stuff. Uh, yeah, I kept it moving and I skipped over, I guess, what I considered less, you know, sort of the, the 70s textbook type of stuff that's completely irrelevant to modern politics. I think what really gets cut is the reading. Okay. The reading. Yeah. I was just going to ask that, you, when you um, designed syllabi in the past, do you assign the same amount of reading that you would in a semester and just do it a lot more quickly, or do you cut down substantially? What do you find is appropriate? It's. Uh, I tend towards the latter. I mean, even in my semester-long classes, I keep cutting because I the less the less you assign, the more gets read. Right. Like actually, just sort of the, the you, people don't read the sort of same percentage of what you or the, the same amount. Right? Like if you sign a hundred pages, they might read five. If you just, if you assign fifteen, they might actually read the fifteen. You know, it's like there's this weird. It's, it's like a, a wall erected in front of them rather than a sort of gentle slope that lures them into actually reading the whole thing. No, and once they realize like they don't have to read every page, it's like, that becomes so tempting. Yeah. So, but we had to order our books ages ago. Yeah. So, if now we realize we've ordered too much, I, what so is the book, does the bookstore actually have all these things, or do students buy them elsewhere anyway? Uh, they often buy them elsewhere, and I encourage, so there's a number of good points in your question there. So first, I'd say I encourage people not to uh, always have to buy the newest edition of a textbook that, uh, you know, basically gouges them and adds, like, in my case, it's new, it has a picture of Obama in it, um, and it costs, like, a billion times more. I don't mind if they buy the older version used off Amazon. The second point is they'll have... Uh, these books stocked at the bookstore, which is important, um, but if you find that you've uh, anticipated that you sort of are going to assign too much reading given these books you've ordered, I would put some into a recommended reading part That's of the thing. That's what I'm thinking, but then the bookstore is not going to sell these things, I assume. Oh, no, they, they, if you've already uh, uh, partnered with the department and placed the sort of uh, official orders of the books, they will be there. and. Then students will just not buy, properly not tend to buy the recommended readings as much, but uh, Unless but the about that. and so I <laughs> we'll start and send it back. Yeah, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah. This is not yeah. Right. I think okay. as the instructor, I'll luckily, the, the, okay. I think that's I think that's a good way. To you had a question too. Right? Oh, I was just going to say about the. I guess you'll be talking about this um, compressed time, but when you actually calculate the time, like two hours times. Four, eight hours a week for six weeks, it's actually, you know, it's, it is that the, the semester. Yeah. Yeah, the time-wise is it's just a semester. So I think that maybe the, the question is that it has to do with endurance and maybe, yes. you know, that time to, uh, you know, what kind of time do we have or do students have to um, actually understand and write? So that's, that's what right. Yeah, it's a, it's a fatigue issue. I mean, in my note for this slide, I just have no perfect way to do this. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a sense of how, like, what else, is our course the only course they're taking in that window, or what are, what are student undergraduate summers looking like? Great question. I've two, seen three, people five. taking two, mm -hmm. off, sometimes three, although, bless you, there's like almost no room in the week for that for them to do three, but I've seen it. And those students are just like beside themselves. Yeah. They're so busy. So one to two, I think. Yeah. But often, in my experience, they'll come from, you know, if you're doing an afternoon course, uh, they'll come from another three hour summer course, and they're zonked by the time they get yeah. to you. So. Absolutely. And that's when they love the films. You know? <laughs> and that's like, it can be a really engaging way to teach the material that it's it's difficult to explain, right? In some cases, a picture really does tell that part. I would also say a lot of the regularly enrolled students who are here over the summer are also still working. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Um, daytime and, hours can be hard. And that's another split between your international students or, you know, who are doing a semester, a summer course at Berkeley, kind of for their resumes, you know? 
versus students who are trying to sprint through because they are on a budgetary constraint versus students who, um, you know, who it's, it's better for them to be on campus than at home during the summer, a variety of things. Um, one thing, and this, this relates a little bit to the, this, you know, how you fit a semester's worth of, of, of readings in, is it's actually the, it's the outside time that's hardest, right? It's, it's you know, turning, turning a reading around that night for a lot of students is, you know, it's very difficult. I, the first time I taught the class, I had a midterm, and the midterm happens like at the end of the third week, right? And you've barely started anything. And the, I, I found the midterm to be a relatively futile exercise, um, and maybe futile also. Um, <laughs> like, I think an in-class sort of a quiz thing that kind of gets their attention. But there's a lot of other things, and I've done this in regular term courses as well, a lot of other things to get a sense of where people are at. Like I do an ungraded anonymous entrance quiz on my globalization course. Like do you know what the WTO is? And uh, students who will say exactly what it is and students who will be like, no, I have no idea in all caps because they, they're frustrated that they <laughs> didn't know any of the things going in. And that will give you a sense of like, it comes late for designing the syllabus as a whole, but it gives you a sense of where, like, what the holes that need plugging are, right? Where to pitch. Uh, I feel like another thing that helps with the readings is if you, because theoretically, as going back to your point, like, you're supposed to have all the same content, mm -hmm. like, hours-wise, yeah. <laughs> but it's just, with six weeks, you're right, yeah. like, they're not going to do it. Um, it's having all the readings at the beginning, of, like, having them know all the readings at the beginning, rather yeah. than, like, every week being like, oh, and this, and this, because that can be kind of yeah. scary for the students. So then they can plan out there okay. when they read. And One thing I've taken to doing on syllabi is actually putting in bold the really key pages of a reading. And I have this thing, I pulled it off someone's CV, or someone's syllabus at, I want to say, Oberlin, that was like, you don't read social science. Like, this isn't a novel. There isn't going to be a twist. They tell you exactly what they're going to say at the beginning. They tell you what they said at the end. And the way that you read social science is like very strategic and very different. And if something is taking a long time, just skip it and ask a question in class. And like getting, and that I think goes double it essentially for a summer, a summer course where there's so much happening so quickly. And if they pour over every last word of a reading as though it was a really ripping novel, then they will just get behind. I'll often do something similar, like after the first set of readings, I'll just take one reading and tell them we're going to talk about how to read this one, and yeah. show, like, see, you didn't have to focus on, you can often get caught in the details and wait for the exam. Yeah. And I'll also put a lot of time into making a reader where I'll highlight and underline for them, like, key points and star where the thesis is, yeah. just to be like, I, I want you to learn it, I don't want you to have to struggle to learn it, right. so with that, that's a good call. More upfront time, but it pays off. Um, so, uh, we'll often have you know, three or four or two for um, different sessions in a week. Uh, I wonder um, if you assign readings for each of those days, um, or if you do, like, you know, this week I want you to read blah, 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 like, you know, you know, I recommend weekly and yeah. um, but not, not by day. Right, um, given that inevitably something will come up on some days, the schedules are different, but uh, um, even weekly, I think there's a lot of spillover. It's hard to keep up. People may do more or less. But whoever mentions it, they're putting all the reading up front. So this is a good idea as well. Oh, I had a similar question. I was planning to do, like, uh, assigning for, like, for you to read for Monday and Wednesday, we kind of, like, will, like, continue to talk about all the time. But I wasn't sure if that was better than or like splitting it up into more shorter assignments for each day was, was better. I think you know that these things would be challenging, but I think possible um, to do if you think that would be better to keep people up. And I, I also think that as people have been sort of signaling and sort of actually explaining the readings, uh, thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. 
So using some lecture, you know, given that some people, you know, people often are taking other classes in the department or uh, early on in their undergraduate careers, being international students, uh, for all those reasons, explaining how uh, your discipline's uh, sort of uh, written material works, how argument is structured and things like that, and helping them explain it in the next class period. Um, even if students haven't read it, maybe they'll sort of read it after you give them these, the sort of summary of the arguments. I, find, I mean, this stuff is, so I remember me being a late undergrad and finally realizing, wow, oh, all these people, this, they're not just saying facts, they're all sort of various confused theories of yeah. society and world. Wow. Yeah. That was way too late. <laughs> Yeah, well, there we go. We kind of covered that. Um, I I was thinking 75 pages a week shouldn't be a challenge, especially since it's supposed to count towards a semester class, but I think that it is, especially if it's scholarly. If there's a way to bring in something at, that's at the sort of New Yorker level um, as much as you can, right? Um, especially for... Uh, for these kind of courses, and especially this will this will bleed into the discussion of the AC specific questions as well, where having students divine the sort of key point of a really important but difficult text on the sort of critical theory of race um, in a, uh, and then compound that if they're not sort of familiar with the you know, tacit knowledges of race, or in California, where they're really used to a sort of a very simplistic binary system of how they think about race in, you know, a place in the United States that they're not racist. Um, the more you can do that is interpretive, that's easier material, it's, you know, it'll get, it's more likely to get read, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, just that I, I think uh, you know telling the students that they will work hard during these six weeks and you know in their class and uh, that I think assigning so for me you know sort of mainstream traditional assignments I think providing uh, uh, some something in an exam or assignment beyond just the sort of usual like a paper where you have to cite resources from the readings or something like that. Uh, a midterm or something where a question is just a basic of like what was this person's argument? What, what is Michelle Alexander's argument about the new Jim Crow? What is the new Jim Crow and why is Michelle Alexander arguments important? Something like that. Um, which at least is a little bit of a gotcha question in there, at least the answer is we should have that red back jacket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you do anything, um, have you, what methods have you done to enforce readings or to like inspire them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, I do reading response, uh, I, when I taught this class I did reading responses. As I've taught more, I've found sort of de declining value to reading responses on their own and I've moved towards reading responses that relate that the reading of that week to a sort of particular theme that they selected really early on at least in the semester and then the final project is that they actually collect those sort of edit and revise them and sort of turn them in as a sort of portfolio on the particular topic. Six weeks is pretty short for that, for even that, but getting, you know, I've had students turn in, again, it's discipline. Disciplines are different, right? I've had students turn in sound recordings from someplace in urban space, for instance, when I was teaching a course that was specifically on the city, right, and the experience of the city. So having those, you know, real, you know, you've got to say something about a reading this week, and but then relate it to something that you're doing out in the world, or that's something else that interests you. Also tough if you have a mix of students who are commuting and a mix of students who literally don't leave the high house. They walk directly from the high house to class and back and don't leave campus. So there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities. In fact, I will jump to how to design assignments, right? Because so reading compliance is one thing. Um, 
the assignments, I think, is a, is a key place to get away from the standard kind of term paper. The term barely happens, and then it's over, and then they're supposed to have some sort of authoritative knowledge that they've assembled based on like a very, very small amount of time. What I did in, when I taught Geography 70 AC, I gave them options, actually, for the final project, for the term project. I had an option where they could do a photo essay of 12 photographs on a particular theme. Had to be out, had to be off of campus. Um, got students who had never been to the US out into you know, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley. Mostly San Francisco and Berkeley, I'll say. Um, a second option was that they could do a sort of ethnography of two bus lines. So I had students in groups compare the 57 bus and the one back when the one went all the way from mm -hmm. campus to San Leandro. That was really successful. And I had students, you know, if you just want to sit around and read a book, you can do, do a sort of in-depth analysis of a particular novel. And I had equal parts takers on all three of those. So I felt, you know, out of 15 students, basically five did each thing. And I felt like that was, it seemed to maybe capture what everyone was ready to do. And for students who struggled really, really hard with language, the photo essay was a good way, you know, some keywords from readings attached to a photo. It sometimes would take some divining as to what this, <laughs> what they, what, what sort of the much more kind of elaborated questions were, but it was clear that they were engaging with a theory that they had grabbed onto as key because I had sort of led them to think about that as a key theory in the class. And so, you know, I found that to be a fairly successful array of assignments. That's nice that John and I are each have our sort of different sort of angles and parts of the class. Mine's, it's like probably as mainstream in the pedagogical style and assignments as an AC summer course gets. Um, but given, sort of what I mentioned before, like, Grading and things. So my class, first of all, so you know, a class with 15 or 20 students, very different. Mine was uh, single GSI and over enrolled, so it was you know maybe 60. I um, mean, this this year I think it's over 100 um, in the big you know theater setup. Um, and uh, for my one GSI, like you know, being a former GSI, I very much empathize with that grading and having to turn it around a little more quickly in the summer. So for those reasons, I found that uh, the assignments so. I felt like we needed a paper that's an important social science skill to learn to make an argument, follow it through, in a sort of you know mid-length paper. Um, but I you know gave exciting prompts, and last year was you know the primary elections were finishing up. There's a lot of hot stuff to talk about. Um, but then I think on exams is I would avoid exams with essay questions. Pers I mean that's a personal preference, but. Uh, it gives room to bullshit uh, where you don't necessarily want it. Um, and I found that giving a pretty clear study guide, I had a midterm final and term paper in between, um, giving a pretty clear study guide on like, key terms was the way I did it, that you do an ID for, so sort of define the term and explain significance in a few sentences. This is uh, much quicker for grading uh, yeah. for my GSI. And uh, it also, the terms sort of flow logically such that I think it did really hit all the, uh, all the uh, sort of key concepts in the class. Um, and it was a mix of uh, through a term, making an argument about the definition or significance of the term versus some that are more just uh, rote memorization types. Uh, and I found that that was easy for the GSI to turn around. So I recommend uh, coming up with a creative way to not do too much grading given the turnaround. What about reading compliance? So reading compliance, so the key terms, uh, many of them were things like this person's argument about this concept. You have to define the argument, say, uh, you know, this Matthew Iglesias from Vox argued that uh, single member congressional districts are the reason there are no third parties that are viable in American politics. Like, or it was that our, Matthew Iglesias' argument about the lack of third parties is the ID term. Uh, that really requires that they at least know that reading or stuff, you know. And this is a way, you know, if they haven't done the reading on time, when they see that 
name <laughs> referencing a ring on the study guide and know it's going to be on their like, major graded yeah. assignments, they, you better believe they'll at least look at it. What about throughout? Did you do anything like sort of by the week? Yeah, so I had started, uh, so after a little bit, I uh, started a uh, sort of ungraded reading response thing, like you get a full credit for an honest effort, even if it's total nonsense, uh, and uh, that I did start doing that weekly, and that helped. I, I think in retrospect it wasn't super necessary, but it, it made me feel better that I was worried they weren't doing it. So. But uh, it's a combination of some people don't do it. It's like a lot of people found them hard to understand, even though they're sort of New Yorker mm -hmm. level, yeah. hard to understand without a background in this. Because, um, you know, I mean, the New Yorker or Vox or any of these places, it's like they're marketing to, you know, coastal liberals who went to college and stuff like this. <laughs> Um, uh, so being aware of that, but I found that uh, really explicitly mentioning the readings in uh, sort of in quizzes, midterms, finals has uh, been really helpful. Yeah. Um, I go, I argue against uh, multiple choice for pedagogical reasons, but uh, I mean you're totally free to do that, and that will make it ridiculously easy. But I think that uh, is a little more problematic. For Oh, I'm just, I, I have that, um, for the question for the reading science and then preparation for the writing when I was in JSI, um, and a class where they didn't have the students kind of have a lot of writing, um, practice for the midterm, but it was an essay based midterm, so I wanted them to get some practice, so I did a short, um, in-class writing assignment that was also ungraded, you just got to check if you did it, and I gave comments for their right to help them for an intern. Um, but the question was about the readings, um, but it was designed in such a way to give them practice with the kind of essay they have on the midterm. And I did have students who just wrote, uh, I like passed out the paper with a prompt, and just wrote, I'm sorry I didn't do the reading. So it was explicitly a check, of, check for understanding, it was a check for compliance. Um, and hopefully it gave them a chance with like timed in class writing and me a chance to give them feedback on their writing and preparation for the midterm. So it, it actually served a lot of goals. Um, they're in class, um, and uh, just logistically, the last day of class, you should probably have your, if you have a final, the last day of class, there's no finals, additional period, Yeah. Um, so just budget that in your schedule. For second to last day, we get an email, or at least in my contract, it said that the Friday, a lot of people will be leaving, and so don't do it then. If your class is normally scheduled on Fridays. It would, well, I'm teaching in summer session B. Maybe it's not true for the earlier ones, but they were saying that a lot of that they try to get international students to not leave early, but that a lot of them do, and they're making them move out of the dorms that day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I've already so done my syllabus. The last Friday of term, so yeah. So, so I wonder if your normal class period, it's on a Friday. This yeah. Probably is oh, a huge yeah. deal. Only if you're a classmate on the phone, maybe. But hopefully, hopefully the students are vocal enough to like really grumble and complain. You'll usually have at least one. Oh my gosh. But then it's like, what, do I have class and hope no? I mean, and be like, yeah. well, no one's going to be here, but... Also, like, they're, here they're, here. Here. <laughs> they're here for the class. They'll they'll the class. I don't know. All right, well, let's check up on this, but then we'll push it up to the Wednesday. If yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was going to say, um, another option for making sure that they read or encouraging them or inspiring them. Because I've been working with the Berkeley Resource Center for Online Learning a lot for my online class, and... You can have you can do like a prompt on B courses and have just a check off if they answer it. Yeah. And then you can actually have other students peer evaluate their answer. So you can make it kind of like an online discussion. And this and my classes are always really big, so it's really helpful to have those kinds of things. Because in a big classroom, there's only a few people that ever really speak up. Right, right. Yeah. No, and that, that's actually nice to outsource a little, little work to yeah. check it. That's a great call. Um, with the payback. I just wanted to, are we going to uh, uh, talk about absenteeism and uh, emergencies dur during this? That, yeah, this is good. This is an okay. okay time to bring that up. Yeah, so uh, uh, absences. So uh, I had my GSI sort of informally take role like once or twice a week, so maybe half of the class periods, and try to stagger them randomly so uh, the kids come. But I also, uh, if I. Don't, if I do say so myself, I think my lectures were good and the kids came. <laughs> um, the students came. 
uh, for the most part. Uh, but I think that's that's something. So both learn it when a student is sort of learns that they can get by without doing readings, or learns that they can get by without going to class. Those are uh, problems that we want to nip in the bud, and uh, you know, some sort of attendance type of grading maybe helpful there. And then uh, for emergencies, that's another great point, given that it's such a short time period if somebody's out a week or something like that, that's a big deal. Um, so uh, you can have a sort of maximum amount you can miss to be able to pass the class. That's a thing in the, during the semester people do. But uh, uh, for emergencies, it's first it's just really important, again, to tell them to speak up as soon as possible if uh, they think anything is going to obstruct their sort of ability to complete the class requirements, but yeah, that's a tough case by case basis. But uh, emergencies do happen, and yeah, oh. I, I guess I'm talking about the emergency that happened right before the midterm, right before you know, like that kind of you know, those kind of emergencies that you know, you, you know that they're not really emergencies. You know, they oh. may be like, oh, they, I'm just saying, like, how do you? So I put, you so know, they're, so they'll ask, you know, you know, extension on their, right. you know, paper, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Great question. So on the syllabus, I think, it, uh, you know, it sounds like everybody's taught either as a GSI or instructor in some capacity, but uh, syllabi usually have a uh, sort of language about that. And I, I, you know, I think the language should be pretty uh, sort of strong language about this that, you know, how you get approval for these emergencies, how you document them uh, without invading privacy and uh, things like that, and uh, the resources available for people, and sort of the, th the reality that if something comes up, you know, they're not able to complete the class. You know, there's sometimes you can give incompletes and have people do things after the fact. That's tough uh, administratively to deal with, but that's a possibility too. But um, using your judgment and being, you know, being very caring and open, but it's somewhat of a hard ass to balance. And caring the number one excuse is medical, so just ask for a doctor's note. So what is the so there's you, the doctor so procedures. It will just has to say that they visited. It doesn't yeah, have to say yeah. anything about. Right. It just it adds like another level. Of, they started encouraging us not to do that. Oh really? Yeah, I do remember. For like, cough for colds. Blue, that kind of thing, yeah, we were encouraged not to. Because either what will happen is... There was a flu outbreak in the uh, semester. Oh, yeah. And they didn't want everyone with the flu going out to the doctor. And uh, the just to get the tank center yeah. is part of the reason. Tank center doesn't want everyone coming through for a note. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the flip side of it is that if you have to have a note mm -hmm. and the tank center is full, then they'll come to class and spread it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I get that. It's... <laughs> Um, I mean, that gets a little bit into sort of how you design the class where it's good to have a balance of things that they can't get from, say, if you post lecture slides on the courses after the fact, which I typically do. Um, it's good to have enough that they can't get from there that, that there will be robust attendance, but also something to where if they couldn't come to class really legitimately, they're not just like totally screwed on the material for that day. I'm wondering about the, like you said you have a, you have a, a terminal project, you've got even an essay. How to deal with the fact that it's so compressed and so, you know, over a 14 week semester, missing a slow, getting a slow start on a end of term paper is not that big a deal, but here, a slow start and you're screwed? How do you, <laughs> I mean, you're just... important question. So I think I hammer home what I consider the good habits of doing this type of class for the students, and I think one is get started as early as possible. You know, I'll give the prompts and study guides and things like much earlier than would, at least in terms of like the proportion of class, much earlier than in a semester type of class. And then, uh, uh, saying really, you know, that procrastination is sort of, I don't know where students get the idea that doing the paper at the last minute mm -hmm. is a good idea, but uh, that it's just really important to get started and it'll be much more successful with the same amount of work at the last minute. With assignment design, another, and I haven't actually done this yet, but thinking back to how you would address some of the substantive issues of what you have to teach, which is the sort of 
hard-boiled, very mainstream social science perspectives. Having a final paper that is, how would I go about finding this out? Like, what kinds of concepts from the class would I use? What sources of data do I think I, where do I think I would find this? What is my argument? You know, have them writing it sort of as a small research proposal rather than, here, I did this research, which you kind of did, but you only had like six weeks, which really means five, which really means in some cases two at the most. Like, having, having something where they, what they produce isn't authoritative knowledge, but an extreme, like a, a refined set of questions that they want to ask, given the opportunity to devote a full semester to that particular question. That's just something that I've been thinking about in my own, in my own pedagogy. Uh, and then we had one, one last, I think, yes. So. How much this all relates, right? Because how much of my time, and, and you know, by extension, the GSI's time, should uh, should I expect to spend? And uh, in my notes, it says more than you think. Uh, <laughs> for my experience, the first time I taught, I again I taught uh, Tuesday, Tuesday through Thursday, nine to eleven thirty. So I basically started working on the class Monday afternoon and. Basically, I, everything that I did was for the class until Thursday afternoon. Um, so if it's been taught before, and you can get some of the materials that people have used in the past, even if it's taught usually during the semester, you can get those materials and truncate them. And something to alleviate that pressure is very, very important for your ability to do the class, not just the students, and and GSI's ability to do the class. And I, I was lucky I was able to do almost all the prep before uh, the sort of summer semester started. I uh, had GSI the class I mean, four times before, or at least the non-AC version, which you know is much less cool and stuff. But still, <laughs> I had the gist of. Uh, this type of class structure, um, and still, so I was, you know, ready to go, and but it's just the human energy component after, it's really draining to, to engage a class for uh, four times a week, um, and then I did find that even though I wasn't having to do much prep, I answered a lot of emails during the session and things like that, but it was, and not having to grade, not having my own GSI, so all these reasons I was more free than, uh, Others may be, and still, it's, I found it the energy component of the training. And I wasn't able to do my own dissertation work after, uh, for the most part, during those days I taught. Um, I was mostly napping. <laughs> 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 uh, can you tell a little bit about, um, like, using PowerPoint in a way that doesn't like make students feel like, oh, I don't have to be there. I can just like download the PowerPoint, but having enough information that they're not like. Curiously, trying to keep up with you. Um. That's too real because <laughs> yeah. I, I, didn't the, I didn't upload the slides initially, and I just got complaint after complaint um, that you know if they miss, you know, an undergrad used to like they really want to take notes on every slide, and it's you know I tried to encourage them not to worry too much about that, but I eventually just posted them, and you know I may have noted a tiny drop off in attendance after that, but. Not terrible, but it's a tough balance. I think probably the best way would be to upload sort of, man, the best would probably be class by class or something like that, upload some stuff. I just had a big file that I didn't want to go through, uh, control C, control V into separate documents. Although, I've, there's probably some way to do that easier, but uh, that would probably be it's a little work, but I like copy all my slides into a separate thing and then edit out key terms Ooh, and nice. tell them that they're going to be slides with key terms missing and like the star point at the bottom of the slides not on the slide they have, <laughs> so they could print them ahead of time and I just do the PDFs and they can just fill in the, the sort of things they're missing and that keeps them a little attentive too. So. That's great. Extra credit is is that a bad idea in summer session? Um, I didn't offer extra credit. I 
I think that's totally viable. I've seen it. Because I was thinking of having a multifunctional thing which would encourage them to read, which would encourage them to read just for the essence, and which, of having extra credit. And I've been watching the NBA finals, okay? Yes. So I want them to, to choose a reading and nominate the most valuable word or the most valuable concept and write one or two paragraphs as to why they've chosen that particular word or concept in that reading. And get extra credit for that. And it will encourage them to read, I think, in a different way, as well as... So, I like that. I think one uh, thing that comes to mind initially is maybe that might be... I wonder if there's a way on the B courses grading system to do this, but then again, because I'm sort of... Well, I don't I'm not... You, you may not... I don't think I'm going to use a grade. Spreadsheet or handwritten grading uh, notebook or uh, whatever you use. But uh, yeah, have you not uh, used any extra credit? Um, no. I think what's I think it's interesting to have it very straightforward in advance. Um, and this gets to the managing your time as well, and have them understand that they are not going to know how much extra credit they got before the sort of final scores are tabulated. So it doesn't create more small assessments for you to take care of through the course of the class because that, be, you know, if you have students be like, so did I get extra credit on that? And they're trying, they're like doing the numbers about what they have to get on the final. Uh -huh. Having it understood that this is, that this shouldn't be something that you consider sort of to make up for something that you did badly on, or like in lieu of something, right? This is a built-in part of the class structure that is your option, but you're not gonna know how you're doing on it until the end of the course, right? Until you get the final grade. Because I'm just thinking, you know, again, from the time management, from your time. I guess it depends on how many students are in the class. I mean, who who opts in, right, yeah. yeah. I've used it before, I like it in terms of like, uh, Participation issues. Mm -hmm. And like, I, no, 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 you know, you don't have, I mean, you can't make it a full, you know, yeah. an extra credit assignment yeah. to make sure you do that. Like, yeah. I don't, it, it cuts out that whole, like, people trying to, you know, look, I'm really sick, I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, you're just, you have yeah. to deal with, you know, go deal with it, like, yeah. And maybe you just want to go take the one day off, you know, it's like, yeah, a, it's summer. It's, right, it's like, one, there's one, it's like, it's like a little bit of a stopgap um, that's right. in there. To, to, to flesh out the participation yeah. for me. Yeah. So it, and you put that initially. Like, yeah, it's in the front. It's a phone festival. It's got to go and write a review. Yeah, great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about the, both my time and their time in terms of a field component and either, first of all, making them go somewhere. I'd love to hear a whole bunch of things about that, especially when you have students who maybe have only arrived a few days ago. But then also leading field trips or otherwise supervising. Do you any thoughts there? Uh, I know yeah, that, that's what talk, you do with. We can talk a lot more about that. There is some. There is university procedure around liability, etc. You know, people's medications, that kind of thing. Um, I've had only positive experiences doing that. Uh, in when I was a GSI, we would have a field section when I, 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 mean, I teach an entire field course. Um, I think it's great. Uh, and so it's, it can, these big chunks of time can be useful for that as well. It's being able to do something that you wouldn't be able to squeeze into an hour and a quarter long class. So I think that we can, we can maybe talk, if other people are interested, we can talk about it a little bit more in the next section. I am sensitive to everybody's time and probable hunger by now, and the lunches are sitting there waiting. <coughs> um, is there any last minute? See, now I've created a situation where if people ask a question, they're uh, driving other people. Uh, um, if there are any last kind of burning questions on some of these issues, we will circle back around to a lot of these questions with the focus sort of shifted over to the American cultures, the specificity of the American cultures. Um, and then basically what I was thinking is we would kind of take about 15 minutes to assemble lunches, go to the bathroom, etc. And then we would hear from uh, Doug about the, what the American culture's requirement is all about. It's not always entirely intuitive. Um, the story isn't spelled out in at least the materials that I received as a grad student, for instance. So 
we'll hear a little bit, about 15 minutes, and then we'll have more of a discussion specifically about how to teach to the American cultures requirement. Well, thank you very much, John. So I'm Dirk Parada, as I uh, introduced myself earlier. Um, I work for the AC Center. I'm not an instructor, full disclosure up front. Um, but I have been working for the center for about three years, and I was an undergrad. I took a few, I think like three or four AC courses. So I'm familiar with it um, in those spaces. But um, it was something that I took, and I had no idea why I took an AC course. I had no idea why it was required. I so, said, okay, let me know the requirements. And then I found myself taking them over and over and over. And once, you know, eventually I started working here and learned the history. It seemed, you know, something that just shocked me that there was this real personality behind the requirement um, that's very politically driven, um, anti-racism, anti-oppression, and social justice. And uh, what what we did is we prepared a video. How many of you have seen my intro to DC video? Okay, so just a few of you. So that's good. So it'll be new for most of you. Um, and so this video really speaks uh, to the. Uh, sort of the why and the how AC was formed uh, by some of the original founders. I'm just going to start that up. I want to start uh, in thinking about American cultures and why it's so important to think back to that time. Uh, because there really is a very direct connection between the anti-apartheid movement and the birth of American cultures. And there was this spark ignited in South Africa when the government decided to allow so-called Indians and coloreds to participate in elections for the first time, a reform that they thought would ease some of the political pressure, but instead had the opposite effect and gave birth to the United Democratic Front, and the, for the first time in many years, open political protest in the country. So once again, the government was forced, or felt forced, to respond with violence against these protests, which brought South Africa back on all the news. And so that then led to first Longshore workers here in San Francisco refusing to unload cargo from a South African ship led to Trans-Africa uh, starting a series of protests with the Congressional Black Caucus at the South African Embassy and started a movement across the country that particularly took hold on college campuses and Berkeley especially. To be associated with a movement that actually succeeded um, was uh, really unusual, <laughs> um, but still highly significant. And because of the momentum that we'd built and, and, and we were really filling our oats, we said, well, now, if we could do that, we could do more. <laughs> we can begin to dismantle some of the racial barriers here on the campus. And so we started thinking about the curriculum and looking at the faculty. And the fact was that although Berkeley had been one of the first campuses, to create an ethnic studies program because of student protest. It had become a place where ethnic studies was totally marginalized and where there were very, very few faculty of color anywhere else at the university. And we said, this has got to be our issue. For those of us who were students on the campus, we've got to make sure that we desegregate the campus, desegregate the curriculum. Although it was a compromise, it was a compromise that I think actually did something profoundly significant on the campus. Now, Ron Choi, who's played a critical role in this, and Troy Duster, uh, a mentor of mine, uh, also played a very important role, because what they did was they said, what we're going to do is create a requirement that could be offered anywhere on the campus. And we'll establish criteria that these courses need to meet, a comparative criteria. Right. So you're not just learning about an experience, you're learning about multiple ethnic and cultural experiences in these courses. 
and we're going to give faculty resources to develop these courses, and we're going to get, bring faculty together to talk about their work, something that was unheard of at UC, that the faculty would actually talk about teaching. Right? <laughs> you know? Think about that. We're really proud that American culture is, is in so many departments, including education, engineering, electrical engineering, ethnic studies, integrative biology, legal studies, architecture, anthropology, public health, theater, dance, and performance studies, and, and so many more. And in the context of those courses across departments, students have been engaged with many kinds of movements, including movements for environmental justice, for human rights, prison abolition, uh, Bay Area social movements, immigration rights, indigenous movements, the fight for K-12 education and high quality education, and the arts and social justice. And so through these courses, students have had the opportunity to really engage a lot of very contemporary issues um, that are plaguing our society today. I think different universities are experimenting with different models of engaged scholarship. But I think what's unique about the Berkeley approach is the twinning of American cultures and engaged scholarship. Because what it does is to make questions of race, class, gender, and other inequalities central to engaged scholarship. So the way I like to think about it is that engaged scholarship becomes a very intimate confrontation with those lived experiences of race, class, and gender. I feel like with the community engaged scholarship, right, it makes it, it, makes it theoretical, practical. And, and my critique of education is that we learn all these theories, we learn about all these people, but how is that addressing my day-to-day -day life? I don't believe that education or the knowledge that we're learning about is just for our brains and then we just go ahead and make a whole bunch of money. It's about like what can we do for our society and how can we help out those around us and the community that in communities in which we come from. And I think community engaged scholarship does exactly that. Um, and it makes like life for these people real. If you never lived this experience, the only way for you to really know about it is to actually be embedded and immersed in that experience. And that's what engaged scholarship does, what I in my opinion, that's what it does for me. But I think in the final analysis, we're talking about uh, teaching. We're talking about making uh, uh, it possible for our students to prepare for the 21st century by having the opportunity to participate in community engagement and to know firsthand what their issues are and not just take a second hand or accept at face value what a particular textbook says or by some, by some social scientist who is an expert in the area.
but it's sort of been um, part of more of ACES courses, the Community Based Scholarship. Um, and that is an important distinction. And that's something that I've pulled up here. So the Community Based Scholarship piece um, certainly. It's never, to answer your question, it's never a requirement for a PC course, but it's something that comes up, uh, especially when students are engage engaging with community organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've done here is we created, um, sort of curated all the ACES courses and some of the projects that students have developed in some of those courses. So you'll see here, uh, they're listed by department. Um, and the video kind of talked about them, but this is really a page, and the way to find it is you go to our, uh, our website, uh, students, and you go to student projects, and that will pull this page up. And that will show you all the different projects that students are developing. Um, so I'll just probably take a minute to uh, show you some examples. Um, the one that I always like to bring up is um, integrated biology. Of course, ACES, AC, is, as it said in the video, tries to show as many, as many spaces as possible. That's one thing that we're always trying to being not only social sciences and humanities focused, but also STEM focused. Um, and so one of the courses that we've had, a, we've actually developed an ACES course for is Integrated Biology 35 ABC, which is Human Biological Variation. And so in, one, in that course, they actually developed Wikipedia as classroom assignments. Now, are you all familiar with how to develop it for Wikipedia as a classroom assignment? I see some yes and some no's. So that was actually uh, something that started, that came out of the thesis course. We had a Wikipedia Wikipedia geek that knew how to develop uh, Wikipedia pages because most of the time you try to create one, they get taken down if you don't know how to do your citations or the format. The Wikipedia community will come in and uh, edit it or just take it down. And so uh, we were fortunate that we knew a Wikipedia uh, geek who was part of that community who helped develop some of the first ACES uh, Wikipedia pages, everything from uh, uh, prison industrial complex, mass incarceration pages, which didn't exist until the ACES course, uh, partnered with uh, Critical Resistance to Develop some of those pages. Um, so these are other examples that were developed in the integrated biology class. Uh, and so some of these either didn't exist or, you know, were like an error or something. Uh, but when you click on them, you'll see the work that the students have done to really make it really an in-depth Wikipedia page. Um, the reason for it is, you know, research shows that that is where the world is educating itself, is on, on Wikipedia. You know, it's the sixth most popular website, and it's being preferred over these Wikipedia, these wiki pages that are developed by uh, specialists in the field. So uh, we thought, why not go with that, against that page? and uh, develop these Wikipedia pages. And so these are some that students have developed in here. Um, and as a result of this being such a hit, the Wikipedia Foundation actually developed these modules in which they'll teach students how to make a Wikipedia page from scratch so that they don't get taken down. You know, the Wikipedia uh, community will go through it. They'll edit it a handful of times. Uh, usually, like I said, they'll edit it about somewhere from 80 to 100 times before it finally stays happy with it or they just take it down. Um, but, you know, students have developed such quality work thanks to these modules, thanks to the community partners that they work with on this information. Uh, the Wikipedia community is, touches it a handful of times and there you go, that's the final product. So those are some, some examples um, and we have information on how to develop some of these Wikipedia videos. I see some hands up, so. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm not sure if you're going to you answered her question. I think the question was, is it, so, is it have to be social justice? And I think social justice comes in different forms, right? So even though it doesn't seem to be you know, in your face, mm -hmm. it could be that one that will um, maybe um, assist in, some, in, in other ways, right? Um, so it could be just the intervention that could provide one to do research on something that's more pertinent than social justice. So I'm just wondering if that's what we watch in the video. Right. I feel like the social justice is uh, it's, it's the core of it's, you know I, I just feel like that that's the, one of the core elements. So um, I was wondering if you could answer you know is it, is it, if it doesn't have to be right. social justice then what else could be 
you know, what, what example could you give that is non-social distance? I guess that's the that's question. Right, right, right. Um, so I'll get to your question in one second. Um, but to answer your question, um, I would say it doesn't explicitly have to be right. part of uh, you know, your, your course outlook when you're developing and presenting your materials to us. It definitely has some intersectionality with some of the issues that come up uh, in talking about race and the comparative of America and understanding what that means, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be named, but of course given that conflict sometimes it's inevitable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, <clears throat> continuing with that a little bit, I mean this uh, courses with components of social justice are more easy to develop over the 15 weeks, of course if you are working with lots of international students who don't even have the context yes. of uh, what's going on politically, socially, etc. That's one thing. And then the other thing is these Wikipedia projects also take a lot of work. Some of them are for, for the summer courses, so they are all belonging to 15-week courses. So I would say, okay, so to answer your first question, yes, it is definitely a challenge, let's go back here, uh, to, uh, to host ACES courses during the summer. Um, because of, like you said, because of demographics, um, because the students may not be aware of some of the issues, especially with the international. Um, but there are instances of ACES courses that have been very successful involving international students. Uh, one, of, uh, one of which is the music course that we offered about two summers ago. Um, and it was so successful that we actually uh, developed uh, the sort of vignettes that really speak about the project over the course of the summer, which is uh, students worked with a local community organization in Richmond called RISE, uh, which is a youth center, on developing a hip hop mixtape. <coughs> and so that community had experts in music writing, in, in software, uh, uh, music production, and they actually taught students, both uh, local and international, on how to really do a lot of self identity exploration. Um, you know, and with the intersection of race, uh, class, gender, uh, sexual identity as well, um, to really uh, express what that meant to be uh, an American, not just, you know, by label, an American citizen, but to be an international student, partaking in this American experience, partaking in the uh, American classroom, uh, working with the community organization to do a lot of self-exploration. So they did a really fantastic job. Um, you know, it's but it is definitely difficult. It's challenging, I should say, given that, that, that short window of six to eight weeks. This is a good example. Yes. So I'm just wondering: Are there workshops or other resources available to you about developing basis courses? Yes. So I'm saying I'd love to do that. Some more stuff. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's a great question, um, and that's a good segue into. Uh, resources that the ACC has for the I'm sorry, I think you had another question. The Wikipedia okay. thing? Yeah, the Wikipedia. Has it ever happened in the summer? Or just the yeah, so, okay, so the Wikipedia pages, so the so we can share that information with you all, uh, with the Wikipedia Foundation. It's called Wiki Education Foundation. That will put you in touch with how to learn to develop uh, classroom modules so you can do Wikipedia pages as classroom assignments uh, during the summer or during the fall. It's really just up to the instructor if they can but do you have any examples that happen during the summer? Uh, we haven't had any yet. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, I will say, just because I've worked with the Wikipedia Foundation doing that, um, typically the modules that students have to take to learn how to do it, it's like one per, per week. Um, and so it typically takes like seven weeks for students to do. And so unless they want to do all of them like in one city, mm -hmm. but typically they kind of space it out. So that's why it's not common in the summer. Right. Just because it's, it's typically spaced out. But students can do all the modules like in one day if they wanted to and could learn how to do it, but because they're already doing a lot in the summer, it's still, right. you know, I recommend that. Yeah, so that's why we don't have any examples now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, okay, so thank you. So it is possible. It's challenging. Very good. So, <laughs> to answer your question, Marga, about uh, uh, the courses, uh, about <laughs> development, to develop brand new ACES courses, or even if you just want to develop a component that can engage scholarship into your AC course, but not turn it into a full-on ACES course. We do have grants that we offer, and uh, this product, so if you can just go to the faculty, um, and this is where you can read on 
the opportunities that we have. Um, so there's three grants at the moment. We have, like I said, an AC course development grant. Um, if you want to bring in uh, community members, if you want to uh, develop certain projects, uh, field site visits for students, um, we would recommend that you apply to ACES course development grant. That is open. There is no deadline for that. That's ongoing. Um, there is a, another grant which we'll hear about in just one second. Um, and then there's, of course, an ACES course grant. Now, these do have deadlines. These haven't opened up yet, but they will be very short. So we'll make sure to send it to you all as well if you're interested in developing a course uh, you know, for the next two years. Uh, we, like I said, we have had a few, just a few days doors in the summer, so we can uh, talk to you about know, that this like. That's also, yeah, so that would be an area where I could support you eventually, Barbara. I'm Andrew, okay. I don't know if you heard my <laughs> yes, introduction, yeah. but yeah, where Victoria or I could sit down and kind of talk to you about what you're imagining. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then, of course, a continuity grant is if you've already had a course, you need to offer um, And like I said, the place where you can really see what that work has looked like, if you're curious about examples, really is this ACES student project. So one more thing, but I wanted to see if there's any more questions. Okay, and so in addition we, to having the, the grants that we uh, mentioned, some of you have probably gotten emails about me, about deadlines for submitting things, uh, and especially if you're in the instructor to a course. So just to emphasize, I think we do offer to work with instructors one-on-one -on, -one on developing new AC courses or getting approval for AC courses. And so all of that you can do uh, by contacting myself um, directly or sending an email to uh, uh, American Cultures at you. Um, in addition, we also have a uh, library liaison, Carlos Lee, who will work with you if you want to develop a research project for your students, or if your students need help with the research project that they have. I brought some business cards, I don't think I have enough, but the information is pretty much the same, that's her email, and she's sorry she couldn't be here, uh, but she is more than happy to work with all of you. So, yes. Um, so I just have a quick question about the uh, approval process. Um, so I know there was like a backlog. Um, With what process? The approval process. Approval process. Uh -huh. um, there, I know there was a backlog for uh, the last meeting. Um, do you know like what the oh, like right. how how likely is it that uh, like for those of us who got delayed um, for teaching in the first six weeks? You know, yeah. <laughs> um, how likely is that we're gonna have to like do revisions or kind of yeah. some back and forth? Yeah. Um, given the like, short turnaround time. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So one good thing uh, that we've experienced this summer, uh, or this year, rather, is the development of a lot of new AC courses, which is great for us and I think great for the campus, right? We have, on average, we have about 30 to 50 developed in a year. We got eight. So, <laughs> yeah, but not necessarily new, but new instructors teaching courses. So all instructors have to be pre to teach an AC course uh, by the academic subcommittee for AC. Um, so that's been great, but like I said, for that reason, that's why there's been a delay in your uh, approval process. Um, so and thank you for your patience, but there will be a meeting in May, and I'm sure they'll get to it by then. If not, there also will be the opportunity for the uh, summer. But if you do have, like I said, questions about the materials, if there's something that uh, you, know, you want for us to look at, please feel free to contact us. We'll be happy to go over that with you. But otherwise, it will. If you got backlog for April, it will get reviewed. And how how frequently do they ask for revisions? Or, uh, it, it depends. It, it really depends. It's a case by case basis. But I will say, the more um, you work with a Victoria on reviewing those materials before you submit, the more likely you are to get approved the first uh, second time. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, um, but if you do think of any other questions, like I said, here's our contact information. Uh, please feel free to contact us for anything. Uh, AmericanCulture.org.edu, that's the best way to get in touch with us and receive a, a response to your email inquiry as soon as possible. Um, or, you know, come by and see us. We're just, you know, 
360 Stevens Hall. Um, and so, we're never going to find that. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're happy to meet you outside of the building. We're happy to find you outside. Yeah, that's, that's the first, actually. Test. <laughs> if you can find our center, and, and, you know, and you've already made this significant progress. Um, if there's not any other questions, I'll turn it over to Giselle. But like I said, uh, please feel free to come to us for any questions. So I'll be very brief, but I know that you all want to hear about a great way to get a little bit of money for the summer. Mm -hmm. So the regular amounts. Oh, sure. things. 
that people will see in a new way when they're talking about it in class. Um, so we're just trying to build a collection of clips that people can use easily if they want to. And some people don't want to stick with the clips. You don't have to. Um, some so people end up just using it to stream full films. Okay. And the instructions are on there? What's that? The instructions for the Ask of Us is on there? Uh, you've got to contact me. There's a little tiny worksheet you'll use. Um, but basically, you'll, you would need to apply for this Library of Foreign Language Film Clips account and send me an email and say, I'm looking to get the money. The timeline is pretty short because we got to get it in before the end of the fiscal year. We're not sure if we're going to be offering this again next year. So if you're interested, either talk to me now or send me a little email. Questions? He, look, he's I'm back. You can see the dollar signs in his eyes right there. He's thinking of that GSI. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to send him to a conference. And also, I already used the template. So let's talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, foreign films uh, in foreign languages. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And most of them have captions as well. Oh. So if you have a, a a lot of uh, non-English speakers in English over the summer. The captions are very helpful for them. If you have students who are like me and have two children under the age of five, they need captions because home is very noisy. Um, so uh, yes, the, the Library of Foreign Language Film Clips is probably about two-thirds foreign films. And if you love your DVDs, we have about 30,000 DVDs for you to choose from. If there are films that aren't yet in the collection, um, we do need to kind of get going on that quickly in the summer because uh, educational distribution takes a little while. But um, Media Education Foundation, California Newsreel, those films are all readily available to you and your students on Canopy. So um, don't be shy about using the movies. It'll take some of the pressure off of you. It will wake them up. Anything else? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the AC. Oh, um, for yeah, okay. some of the AC issues. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, you know, the, the ethnic slur hunky, meaning Hungarian, uh, hunky work would be shitty work for that Hungarians do in the early part of the 20th century. And things like that actually kind of stunned the students, that there was, that Hungarian was actually broken out from what we think of as white. And he was Armenian um, and didn't identify as anything other than white, but then actually reflected on learning about this kind of historical construction and said, actually, for the first time, I thought of myself as, as other than just basically white. It's like, well, yeah, everybody who is white now was at one point other than just basically white because of how new it is as a category. So I've done a lot of mileage out of historicizing in that particular way. Uh, yeah, agreed. Um, I guess just continuing on that vein, so, uh, uh, so actually, so there's sort of the two types, maybe three types of students that might have some trouble. So a lot of Berkeley undergrads are really into this, um, sort of this part of the reason they choose Berkeley, things like that. Then there's this sort of uh, sometimes international students who aren't from as quite racialized societies, for example, and uh, or other students, uh, no matter where they're from, don't haven't thought about the, for example, the difference between race and ethnicity or the idea of race as a social construct. These type of things are very new, um, or they have an extremely like essentialist or binary view of race or something like that. Um, and uh, that a subset of that group could actually be like highly conservative, actually like a real. I haven't experienced it, but you know, you may get a highly vocal sort of Trump supporter type person that would be interesting. I don't have very much insight into that, but uh, in students who either have a sort of less nuanced view of race or uh, come from a less racialized society and are like, why does everybody talk about race all the time in the U.S.? I think the historical construction of race is extremely important and uh, the best out of Berkeley, only in alignment uh, racial formation just on your own time, even if, you know, it's a different, you know, it's a sort of ethnic studies, uh, like, formal text, uh, and it's basically about the historical and geographic construction of race, and uh, it, even though I teach a sort of mainstream traditional class, I find that explaining my own racial background, racial ethnic background, I'm mixed, uh, how in different places within the U.S. I will be spoken to and different ways, different languages, how historically uh, principles like the one-drop rule would work for somebody like me versus now where I'm phenotypically very white and these things. Uh, I found that uh, very important, but that race as a social construct, the way to push beyond a sort of superficial race as a social construct so it's like meaningless type of way is actually, I think there's a bunch of contemporary examples. Rachel Dolezal, I think, actually is a great example where you can say race is a social construct, not an individual construct, <laughs> like money, where money doesn't have inherent value, just like race doesn't have inherent meaning, but as a society, there are social norms and practices that make it an actual thing that exists outside the individual, um, unlike uh, me making up my own ra you know, race based on how I just feel, regardless of how people perceive me, regardless of my family lineage, regardless of my uh, sort of cultural formation, things like that, um, I found that actually ridiculously useful. You get out, you get out from this sort of uh, contentious nonsense about uh, sort of, you know, snowflakes versus the whatever contemporary debates, and you keep it moving in a way that everybody can feel included in this discussion because you're historicizing and problematizing. Um, uh, so the last thing on this is that it was actually, it's somewhat hard for teaching uh, sort of American political science and American history, uh, much of race is dominated by uh, the boundaries of whiteness and with uh, blackness as the uh, outgroup for most of American history and that's how sort of legal processes were developed and uh, uh, political economy developed and labor markets, all this out of black and white uh, dichotomies and so bringing in uh, uh, Asian American and Latino experience uh, narratives is actually somewhat challenging, and it may I'm, it may or may not be for you guys. But uh, in that way, I think uh, striking that balance, understanding, uh, explaining that sort of much of the foundation is about the uh, black-white binary distinction in the U.S., and that's why you see things like the uh, various rights movements of the post-60s era really 
including for you know LGBT rights, really uh, building on the tradition of the Black uh, freedom struggle. So uh, that's a way to you know it's hard to just say like I'm going to do one of these six weeks for on Asian Americans and someone on Latino story. It's like you want to do it more developmental, maybe things like that. I uh, just those are things to be aware of uh, and uh, customize it as you see fit, but. Hitting them while understanding that uh, it's, you know, just developing a racial pentagon and splitting that up might not be the best. Yeah, I mean, what, what Doug was saying, we're uh, thinking about it in a comparative perspective. It sort of depends on the discipline that you're in. Let me actually just jump ahead and see if there's one. Um, it's actually, we'll come back to that one. But, you know, Thinking about it in a comparative perspective, you know, if it's a film, uh, there are sort of multiple axes within which people are treated as different or as kind of naturally in conflict, right? It's not just maybe hierarchical, but it's in terms of otherness or strangeness culturally. That's like a big sort of multiple axes of difference kind of concept. And in California, we have the advantage of it being very grounded to teach about these multiple axes of difference in a way where it, there are other parts of the country where it would not be intuitive that there, would, that there was race other than sort of the black-white binary, even for people who really wanted to understand and critique race. Um, this gets to a question about sort of is there a kind of a necessarily social justice, is that, is that the sort of core of the curriculum? And I think it is hard to kind of mandate that you see things the AC way, right? Um, but it is, a, it is a university requirement for a reason, and it is being able to understand, you know, again, I, I'm basing a lot on historicization, but the sort of fluidity of the categories, and actually understanding how fluid they are, doesn't mean that you necessarily subscribe you know, that you become a, you know, a, you work for the AC, you know, the American Culture Center afterwards, right? So I think that in terms of mandating, in, in terms of setting requirements uh, for learning, uh, you know, what you were saying, you know, if it's for international students, understanding, under, understanding a bit more about just why the politics of race in the United States are so fraught, right? Because they're so counterintuitive, and so much of it is sort of these impenetrable signs when you look from, from outside the United States. Um, and that might actually shed light on societies they know better. You know, the Japanese students I've had in classes, for instance, are very, they're very wedded to the sort of official ideology that there's no racism in Japan because everybody is exactly the same. And then sort of, getting, kind of breaking open that ideological box is really valuable for the international students who maybe might not need to know much more about the United States, except that it's like a little bit or a lot crazy, depending on their, sort of, their perception of it from, um, from outside. For US students, you know, learning to look at their own kind of tacit knowledge of race and ethnicity with different lenses, right? The, it being a toolkit rather than a sort of catechism is a maybe a good way of thinking about it, um, but it's it's a hard one. Um, setting expectations around and sort of learning what the what what should be the real story, right? And some of that, you know, I think that teaching actually this history of Amer the American culture's requirement can help as well. You know, why is not just like oh we're checking a diversity box that it actually comes out of sort of organic struggles that were very much led by students is another way to make that a little bit more engaging. Let's see what else, because we are basically out of time. Um, I think we, talk, we talked a little bit about the creative work element already, but I think it's kind of, I can speak to my experience, that the sort of that cognitive mapping exercise that I talked about, for instance, um, I've gotten a lot of you know, really great insights into how my students are approaching, approaching, in my case, the question of urban space. Who lives where and why is one of the most fundamental questions you can ask. And people's answers to those questions are the best way to gauge what your sort of tacit common sense around race, class, difference, etc. is.
Um, so I found that to be really useful. I'm happy to talk about resources that I really like. I'm happy to talk about methods, um, the redlining, online redlining archives that I was mentioning earlier. I'm happy to talk about those things. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, and if, uh, even though we're sort of going over time, if you guys have uh, any thoughts. Uh, I mean, this stuff is tough, but uh, you know, it's not something to be too concerned about. Uh, the, it is, in this political moment, it's a tough time to teach about this stuff, and uh, there is a sort of, you know, the, I, a fear is that, you know, for example, that, uh, you know, now there, I, like, if you go on the UC Berkeley, like, meme, student meme pages and stuff, it's like, oh, taking a course in one of these departments is like, white people suck. It's like their <laughs> meme they put, you know, and it's like, you know, that's, well, that is, you know, not <laughs> that, right? it's like, uh, problematizing whiteness. It's hard, it's hard to not make things too personal while also opening up space for people to engage in the personal sometimes. But uh, I think I'm a little lucky with the sort of distance of the social science lens, but at the same time, just something to be aware and if you guys have any thoughts, uh, go for it. I think this is why it's, it's important to you know set the, the social justice as a framework because I think it, it's it's an interpretive right it's, it's not something that's again dogmatic I'm doing I'm doing something on the colonial possibility looking at creative creative space where everyone can right participate so it's not anti anything so it's, it's how you it's, it's your methodology and it's interpretive so I think it's okay to say you know looking at social justice justice in, in all these different ways, right? right? And then, um, I was going to say another thing, but um, race, yeah, exactly, race. Race is not racism, right? Because if you want uh, only and not to work, it's race is, is a verb, it's a work. It can, it can maintain that white, right, white supremacy, but it can also break, it can also do other things. So, so if you can kind of work it in, in a way that it's not just black and white, you know, uh, while looking at black and white dichotomies, that that kind of I think it, it, it about it draws people in to a space where they're not being attacked because it's not individual; it's, it's the structure, right? So, I'm, I'm that's just, yeah. That's well said, and I think the individualized sort of narrative versus right. the idea that there are collective outcomes, there are social processes, there are structures, yeah, extremely important in general, and that's something that uh, you know people and politically people struggle with every day where often the initial impulses go back on in some individual idea. You are a something, I am a this, therefore this. It's a lot uh, a lot richer to engage in the structures. I think that's exactly right. It's tough. And a shameless plug, um, there's a really great clip from a film called Cracking the Codes. Yeah. Um, where it's an older white woman who says, you didn't invent the systems you were born into, you were a very good student, you learned the system. And um, that, I think, takes some of the pressure off of people of, okay, my eyes have been opened, and now what do I do? And she kind of talks through, okay, you feel this moment, and then you move past it, I think is really helpful. That, that super viral clip that yeah. like, might have seen like a two minutes on there, it's like a hundred million views on it. Yeah, but I was putting that like two years ago. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before it hit the center of the, of the race. I do want to quickly jump forward to, I think we've kind of already touched on a lot of these issues, but I wanted to jump forward to a few of the resources that I was just throwing together earlier this week. And I'll, I'll make the slides available to anybody who wants them, so um, but obviously the films and clips, Race the Power of Illusion is an extremely good one. Ways to save YouTube videos as well, Keep Vid is a really good one, you have to use Firefox. Um, but then the syllabi, there's a bunch of different syllabi, Teaching the Trump Moment, there's a Trump Syllabus 2.0, recommend that over the Trump Syllabus 1.0, which was very white and male, ironically, maybe not. Um, <laughs> The American Studies Association has a syllabus repository for all kinds of, um, you know, ways of teaching about these particular issues. There's a standing rock, you know, the syllabus is this, actually it's a really interesting time, the syllabus is the new sort of collective response to particular issues. 
So there's the Standing Rock syllabus, which we haven't talked about Native issues nearly as much today. Um, and the Ferguson syllabus, which now already feels old, but it's still very much with us. Um, so there, there, are lots of, um, there are lots of resources out there, especially for having those tough conversations um, in this particular moment, and especially with Berkeley very specifically being targeted as, in, in theory, a, in, an inhospitable place for uh, right-wing students. Um, I don't know if I have any good answers for how, how you solve that, but I think the historicizing move really is a good one and allows you to get away from the individualization and even get away from the kind of contemporariness of it, you know, that white, whiteness is this bargain that was made long ago that you don't really have much power over, but it doesn't mean that you can snap your fingers and it goes away, and that really everybody is just the same. And that's something that I think is the value of the American culture's requirement, especially. So, you know, hopefully we gave you a few strategies to deal with, you know, some of the potential issues that come up in the classroom, but I think it's, it's actually a really good opportunity at the same time at this particular moment. So, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, whiteness also works works uh, within you know uh, non-white white space. So, oh, okay. So it's, it's not just white right whiteness, but it's also how blackness is too, and what Asian is too has been um, impacted. Sure. The black and white. So I'm just saying because the, one of the toughest questions I, I would get. <clears throat> from students or people of color who are saying, you know, we need to get over it, right? There's this post-racial, or this, or, you know, so it's not that, so it's not just, you know, white people, right. it's people in general, right? right? So how do you grapple with that? Right. I think historicizing and is, again, is all of that, yeah. Individualized, right. as you're suggesting, too. Sure. I yeah. ask for some color made it, and that's not right. a story. Right. <laughs> Well, thank you guys, um, and uh, 